You know, I was reminded this morning in the service again of how wondrous the works of the Holy Spirit are. But what is that? What are his works? What does he do? John 16, uh, verse 12 through 13. Well, in verse 12, Jesus said uh, to his disciples, now Jesus is preparing to go to the cross. He's preparing to leave them and go to his father. In verse 12 of chapter 16, he says to them, I have many more things to tell you, but you cannot bear them right now. You cannot hold them. That's what the uh, word means. They're too heavy and you are too weak. It put me in mind of, of David when he was young and he was going out to face Goliath, remember? And Saul gave him all his personal armor and said, here, you'll need this. And David said, I, I can't carry this weight. Jesus told this to his disciples, there are many more things I want to tell you, but you cannot bear them. You cannot hold them. You cannot carry them. They would crush you. In verse 13, he says, however, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, meaning on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak to you. He is the spirit of truth. He will assure you that these things which I cannot tell you now are true. Now, truth is a proposition, right? It's, it's not a feeling. It's, you don't feel truth. You don't experience truth. You, you know truth. Now, these boys, these disciples had walked with Jesus right? They had heard his teachings. They'd seen his miracles. And that's all you need, isn't it? I mean, um, seeing is believing, right? But let's just imagine for a moment that it's a year after Jesus' death, and here's his disciples are around, and they're trying to get his message out there, and they're trying to remember it. Uh, they're trying to... Um, um, uh, remember what he said, did he say this or did he say that? Or was it really 5,000 that he fed or, or were we just caught up in the moment? Um, was Lazarus really dead? Was Jesus really dead? Did he really rise from the grave after the crucifixion? I mean, we were all an absolute emotional train wreck back then. Perhaps we imagined it all. Perhaps we exaggerated. How do we know these things really happened? Maybe we let our emotions get the better of us. But thank God we don't have to depend on the emotional makeup of the apostles to know truth. Thank God we don't have to depend on the feelings of the apostles to know truth. Because the same Holy Spirit that guided them into truth guides us into truth. Amen. And he's in concert with the Father and the Son. He wants what they want. Well, what does he want? What does the Holy Spirit want from my life? What does he want from me? What does he want from you? He wants you to worship Jesus. Amen. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. God the Father planned this work. God the Son procured it. God the Holy Spirit initiates it into the hearts of the believers. He speaks the truth of the gospel into our hearts. And we can bear it. We can bear it when he speaks it to us. It doesn't weigh us down. It doesn't knock us down. It doesn't slay us. It empowers us to walk. It empowers us to walk. Isn't that what Paul said in Galatians? To walk. Now I was reminded of that this morning in the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, like a dove lighting on my shoulder of how much in control he is and how true the gospel is. See, this is the sermon I plan to preach 
Friday night when I was asked to preach tonight, and I had no idea what I was going to, what was going to be preached this morning. But as I was listening to the sermon, I saw how this sermon that I had prepared fits in perfectly to that. And I want you to see how the Holy Spirit works all things together for the glory of God, the Father, and God the Son. So turn to Ruth uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Ruth's a little tiny book sandwiched in between Judges and 1 Samuel. So Joshua, Judges, um, Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, verse 11. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord makes the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthy in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Like Rachel and like, wait, who? Like Leah? Who who is that? Of course, we all know who Rachel is. They made movies about her. This great, wonderful love story between Rachel and Jacob. Rachel, who was so beautiful, she could bring the lying, hard-living, God-wrestling Jacob to tears. Rachel, who was so beautiful, she could make a shiftless layabout like Jacob work for 14 years without pay just to marry her. Rachel, whom the Bible portrays as the picture of motherhood in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. In Ramah, there was a voice heard, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Leah, weeping weeping for her children? No. Rachel, weeping for her children. We all know about Rachel. So what about Leah? This verse in Ruth says, upon two women were built the house of Israel. Two women will be famous in Bethlehem. Now, we all know what happened in Bethlehem. It was a pretty big deal. But who who is this Leah? Now, my wife teaches a women's Bible study in New York. And last week she asked me, um, just out of the blue, what do you know about Leah? And I kind of spit my coffee out. You know, when you're a preacher, you expect to know everything about the Bible at all times. People expect that. And you kind of expect it from yourself. So I got to thinking, what do I know about Leah? Well, I know she was Rachel's sister. I know that Jacob was tricked into marrying her. Other than that, well, I didn't really know anything about her. So I opened the Bible and did a study of Leah, and I was astounded at what I found. I found in the story of Leah the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Charles Spurgeon said the gospel is is on every page of the scriptures. And it's certainly true here in this scriptural account of the life of Leah. So if we're going to look at Leah, we have to turn to Genesis 29. And we'll look very briefly um, at this woman, Leah. So turn back to Genesis um, 29. This woman who shared the distinction of having, uh, uh, shared with Rachel the distinction of having the house of Israel built upon her. This woman who was famous in Bethlehem. As you turn, I'll fill you in on the context At this time, Jacob is on the run. He has deceived both his father Isaac and his brother Esau. Isaac tells Jacob to go and take a wife from the house of his mother. Who is Jacob's mother? Uh, Rebekah. So go to Rebekah's people and find a wife, and that's what Jacob does. And he comes to a well, and he sees Rachel, the daughter of Laban, who was a ruler in the land, Laban was, and he falls smack dab in love with Rachel. Now, that's a loose uh, translation of the text. And we see in verses uh, 16, 17, and 18, And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So this sounds like something right out of a fairy tale, right? The outlaw prince on the run meets a princess working as a shepherd girl, and they fall in love and live happily ever after. But wait, Laban had two daughters. Who is Leah? Is she about to mess up this fairy tale romance? You better believe she is. 
So what do we know about Leah? Well, a lot of what we know, we know by contrasting her with her younger sister, Rachel. How old was Leah? Uh, we don't exactly know. We know that she was older than Rachel and that Rachel was probably about 15 at this time because it was customary for daughters to tend their father's sheep until they were 15. And here's Rachel at the time of this story, tending her father's sheep. Probably Leah was in her 20s because uh, during this time, 20 to 30 years old was considered the prime age for women to marry. And Leah was obviously close to reaching the threshold of that age. Otherwise, her father would not have been so desperate to marry her off. So Rachel was young. Leah was old. It also says Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Everyone liked her. The name Rachel means you. Not you, like awful, but you, like uh, you lamb. The cultural significance of a you, you lamb was youth, vitality. There were endless possibilities for reproduction. It represented life. So here was this young, vibrant uh, girl that was full of life. Well, what did Leah look like? The Bible says she had tender eyes. The Hebrew word means tired eyes. In fact, the name Leah means weary. Leah was tired. Tired of what? Tired of trying. Tired of trying everything she knew to try to get what she wanted out of life. And what did she want out of life? What every woman wanted out of life at this point in history, to have a husband and to bear children and to be part of her own family. So who knows what all she had tried? Maybe diets and makeovers, cooking classes, Pilates, finishing school, all to no avail. And now she's just tired. Not like her younger sister, full of youth and life, full of potential. No, all she has to offer is her tiredness, her weariness, her death. And who wants to take that into their bed? Who wants to raise a family with death? So you can see the contrast between Rachel and Leah. Rachel full of life and youth and vitality. Leah old and tired and representing death. And so when Jacob sees the two, obviously he picks the better one. He picks Rachel. He tells Laban, I'll work seven years for Rachel. And then as if, as if there's any confusion, he clarifies and says, the, the younger one, this one right here, this is the one I want. Leah is tired. You know, trying will wear you out. Trying will kill you. A lot of people today are trying to please God, trying to get in his family. You know, in the time that, in the place that Leah lived, there were over 75 deities. There were plenty to pick and choose from, plenty to try. Hop in the car and give her a spin. I like this one about this one, but I don't like that. This car handles good, but there's not enough room in the front seat. Like ye harmony of the gods, you know, you just try until you find one you like. And it's pretty much the same today. People will take up with anything that promises to fulfill the deepest desires of their hearts, whether it's food or drugs or sex or religion. And when that one doesn't work, they just move on to something else until finally there's nothing left to try. And they're just empty and bone tired. You know, the cults, they, they exploit this in people. They prey on people who are missing important things in their lives, and they exploit that emptiness by offering the solution. Um, gangs do this. Hate groups do this. They roam the schoolyards looking for the lonely kids, uh, looking for the bullied kids, looking for the tired kids. But it's not just cults. Some Christian churches do this as well. Come on down to our church and experience X, Y, or Z. We offer family here. If you need family, we got it. We offer acceptance here. If you need acceptance, we got that too. We offer purpose here. If you need purpose, yep, we got it. Whatever you're missing in your life, we got it here. Some of us might come up to Leah and say, hey, you know, we've got a thriving singles group at our church. 
come on down and check it out sometimes. There's lots of eligible guys there. And she'd come, and these people come, and eventually they find out that it was all just another illusion, just another in a long line of disappointments. And they grow tired. They grow to become like Leah. In Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early, and it is in vain that you go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Everything is in vain. Everything wears you out. At the end of verse 2 of Psalm 127, but he gives to his beloved sleep. To those in his family, he gives rest. There is only rest to be found in his family. And all this trying will wear you out. All this building will wear you out. There is no rest for the wicked. But for the beloved of God, those in his family, there is rest. There is sleep. So Leah hears of her father's plan to marry her to Jacob through this trickery. And she thinks, I guess, well, I, I haven't tried that. Or perhaps this is as good as it's going to get. So she agrees. Now, Imagine the scenario on her wedding night. She's getting ready with her gown and all this stuff. And, and she knows it's a lie. She knows she's the man she's about to marry is tricked into marrying her. But she goes through with it anyway. I mean, at this point, what does she have to lose? Then if you look on down after they're married in, in verse 25, it says, And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Jacob wakes up. It's not Rachel. It's Leah. It's not the young, vibrant girl full of life. It's this old, tired woman. And he said to Laban, what is this thou hast done to me? Did I not serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And then if you skip on down to verses 30 and 31, and he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet another seven years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now, here's where the real hero of the story steps in. Here is the most important thing in the whole story. Here is the most important thing in everyone's story. Here is the most important fact of all the facts that can be known. And that is God sees. The Lord saw Leah. Do you know what the very first name for God is given in the Bible? You know, there are many names for God in Scripture. He is called El Elyon, the God Most High. He is called El Olam, the Everlasting God. He is called Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. But the very first time we hear a name for God in Scripture was actually spoken by a woman, and an Egyptian woman at that, and a slave at that. And she was in the desert where she had been banished all alone, no family. And in that desert place, God spoke to her and told her that she would not die, but that he had a plan for her and for the unborn son in her belly. And her name was Hagar. And when she heard the words of the Lord, she said, you are El Roy, for you are the God who sees me. You see, God sees and then God has compassion. This is the motif in scripture. All the way through scripture, God sees and then he has compassion. Matthew 9, 36, Jesus, when he, saw the, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So God saw Leah and he opened her womb. Now, she was able to bear children. Now, this is not just about having kids. This is part of the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis chapter 17, God spoke to Abraham and told him that he would make of him a great nation and it would be done through his seed or through his offspring, but also that it would be done through the womb of Sarah, his wife. So Abraham signed the covenant with circumcision. Sarah's was the womb. So this was not just about having kids. This was about being brought into the family of God. Leah is being brought into the family of God. And that's what the gospel is. That God, who saw you and I, his enemies, 
and made a way to bring us into his family. So, down down in verse 32, God sees Leah and opened her womb, verse 32, and Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Now, the name Reuben means simply, behold a son. Now, think about that. <laughs> behold a son. Here's a son. What's his name? Here's a son. Nothing special about him. Just a son. See, all Leah wanted at this time was for her husband to love her. As if the Lord had only done this to give her what she desperately wanted in the love of her husband. As if God opened her womb so she could have the love of her husband, which is what she wanted. Surely the Lord hath looked on my affliction, she said. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. The son was merely a means to an end. He could have been any son, as long as it got her what she desired. Here's a son. Here I have produced this. Now you must love me. And isn't that the way a lot of people try to treat God? We want God to love us because of who we are instead of in spite of who we are. So we pile up works to try to prove our worth. We feed the hungry. We shelter the homeless. We adopt the orphans. We vote Republican, whatever it is, and we present it to God. Look, God, here's a son. Look, God, we cast out demons in your name. Look, God, we healed the sick. Behold a hospital. Behold a ministry. Behold a church. And God says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. You are not in my family. No good works will get you into the family of God. You can't bribe your way into this family. So on down to verse 33. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Now the name Simeon means obedient. Now Leah wants justice. That's her motivation. Look at what she says. Because the Lord had heard that I was hated. She felt like she was owed something. And that's what a works salvation is, really is, when you think about it. A work salvation says salvation is not given to you. Salvation is earned. It is deserved. See, before she wanted mercy. She knew she didn't deserve it, but she thought perhaps that she could bribe her way into it. Now she doesn't want mercy, she wants justice. And many people want justice today where they think they want justice. They think they've done enough to earn their way into the presence of God, or they think that God is going to pay them back for all the suffering they've done, they've endured. I've had such a hard life. God owes salvation to me. But God owes nothing to anyone. He owed nothing to Abraham. He owed nothing to Isaac. He owed nothing to Jacob. He owes nothing to you or me. And he owed nothing to Leah. But she believes now that God has acted justly by giving her this son because she was hated. But justice would have been to leave her in her childless state amongst her false, dumb, heathen gods because she was an idol worshiper. We don't want justice. People in hell get justice. See, there's only two options. There's only justice or grace. You're either in the family of God or you're a stranger to God. You're either his friend or his enemy. There is only heaven or hell. So then on down in verse 34, she has another child and she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Now Levi means joined. Now, what's the significance of Levi? Who, who came from the line of Levi? Jesus. The, the priests, right? The, the mediators, those who would stand between the children and their God. Levi means joined, someone to come between two parties. And that was the office of the priest to mediate between God and the people. 
Surely she thought this third son will join me to my husband and fulfill my heart's desire. She had the wrong mediator and she had the wrong object of mediation. You know, with pagan gods, which is the culture she came from, if you wanted good weather, you prayed to a God that could mediate between you and the weather. If you wanted a lot of kids, you prayed and sacrificed to a God who could mediate between you and your fertility. If you wanted money, you prayed to a God who could mediate between you and your finances, between you and your dreams, between you and your health, between you and your breakthrough. But we have a mediator in Jesus who's not a mediator between these things. He's the mediator between you and God the Father. See, that's the only breakthrough you need. I get sick and tired of hearing about breakthroughs. Come to our conference for your breakthrough. Breakthrough in your finances. Breakthrough in your career. Breakthrough in your health. Breakthrough in your marriage. If you are saved in the family of God, you have been given the only breakthrough that matters. Worn out by the world like Leah, worthless, not fit for anyone's family, worshiping your false gods and idols, hating, hating God. And yet God sees you and has compassion on you and not only forgives your sins, but also takes you home to live in his house. And imagine the insult when you get in his house and you start to complain about the room he puts you in. Imagine being pulled from the sea, nearly drowned, sunburned, starved, dehydrated. They pull you in the boat and they sit you down to feed you. And you say, what, y'all ain't got thousand, thousand Island dressing here? I, I think I'll go back in the water and wait on someone else. God does all this for us. And then we say, no, this is not exactly everything I wanted. What did Legion do after Jesus uh, cast out the demons. You know, Legion lived in the graveyards. He cut himself with stones. He ran around naked. This was a, you read the account in Mark, this was a monster. This was like a horror movie in the gospels. And Jesus cast the demons out of him. And what did Legion do after Jesus delivered him? Jesus and the disciples got back in the boat to leave and there was Legion sitting in the boat. And Jesus said, uh, where are you going? And Legion said, I'm going with you. Now, he, 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 what about his life? Did he want to go back and get his life back? Go back to all the things that had been messed up and, 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 and get all those things that he had lost? He said, nope, I'm going with you. He is our breakthrough. And if you look down at verse 35, it says, and she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, now... Now, now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing or stopped having children. So Leah has a first son thinking it will give her the love of her husband, but it doesn't. She has a second son thinking it will give her justice and it doesn't. She has a third son thinking it will give her the desires of her heart. And it doesn't. With the first son, she says, now my husband will love me. But he doesn't. With the second son, because the Lord saw I was hated, now I'll get justice. But she doesn't. With the third son, she says, now my husband will join to me. But he doesn't. With the fourth son, she says, now I will praise the Lord. And she named her son Judah, which means praise. Now, the name Judah is pretty significant in the Bible, right? Some pretty important people come from the line of Judah. King David, yep. But more than that, a greater king than David, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And then she stopped having children. She realized that salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. It cannot be bought, it cannot be earned. It is not a birthright. It is solely and completely by the grace of God. Amen. Now I will praise the Lord, she says. My husband still don't love me. I've had four kids. He still don't love me. Yet now 
I will praise the Lord. The tired one now praises the Lord. Psalm 126, 5, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Now I will praise the Lord. I didn't get the job promotion. Now I will praise the Lord. Nobody showed up at my sermon. Now I will praise the Lord. They repossessed my car. Now I will praise the Lord. He won't love me. Now I will praise the Lord. The cancer came back. Now I will praise the Lord. The drunk driver took out the whole family. Now I will praise the Lord. You know, we talked about David this morning when he was told that his son would die because of his sin. He went and he dressed for mourning, covered himself in sackcloth and ashes, and he sat at the temple and he prayed and he mourned because he said, perhaps God will change his mind and spare my son. And so the son was sick. David was there praying and mourning and begging God to spare his son in sackcloth and ashes. The child stayed sick and the child died and the servants had to go tell David and they were afraid to tell him because they thought he might do himself harm because he was acting, he was so overcome with grief. And they were whispering, you tell him, no, you tell him, I don't want to tell him, what if he does something? I don't want to tell him. And David overheard their whispering and he looked up from his sackcloth and ashes and he said, is the child dead? And the servant said, yes. The scripture says David got up, he cleaned himself off, he took a bath, he put on his clothes, and he went into the house of God and worshipped. Yeah. Now I will praise the Lord. And he said to those people, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. Now I will praise the Lord. How could he say that? How could Leah praise the Lord? even though she still didn't have the love of her husband. How could David praise the Lord even in the death of his son? Because he knew that a true king was rising up from where? From Judah. A vine is growing in Judah. A lion is sleeping in Judah. That's what the Bible says. But a lion sleeps, a young lion sleeps in Judah. And he's going to wake up. David believed there would be a resurrection. I believe Leah believed there would be a resurrection. Real quick, quick in closing, just if you if you read the rest of her story, you find out that uh, things are not perfect after this. She goes back to this old way of trying to compete. She goes back to trying to have children to try to outdo her sister. And it was all this, this game of trying to manipulate Jacob into who was the better wife, who was the better mother. But... If you read on through the story of Leah, you find something very interesting. There was a point where um, Jacob, because he had taken through his trickery, taken all of Laban's money. And so he was going to have to leave. Well, Rachel and Leah were a little disturbed by this because Jacob had taken their father's inheritance. And now he's going to run off with with Laban's daughters. And so they were like, uh, what about our inheritance? Don't we get an inheritance? So what Rachel does, is she goes to her father's house and she steals all of his household gods, which are made of gold and, and silver and precious metals. She steals those saying, this will be my inheritance. I'm going to look out for me. I'm going to get me some inheritance. So she takes those and she steals them and she takes off. But if you look, if you read the narrative in Genesis, every time it mentions Leah, she's with her children. When Laban comes into the camp, Leah is with her children. When Esau comes into the camp and they're expecting war, Leah is with her children. Now, why, why is that? That's her inheritance. Judah is among her children. Judah is the one from whom the Savior will come. So she didn't want to hang on to anything else. She was hanging on to the promise of God, hanging on to her inheritance. Now, 
the last thing, and you don't have to turn there, but in Genesis chapter 49, verses 30 and 31, this is the death of, of Leah. Uh, now, this is, this is Jacob speaking, or uh, the, the, so this is Moses relating uh, Jacob's uh, word. So this is, this is a quote from Jacob. This is what Jacob said. And he said, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron, the Hittite, for possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. You notice anything about that statement? There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. There I buried Leah. She never got Jacob's love. She never got to be his wife. But she didn't need it. And I'll tell you why. Because she was buried in the tomb that Abraham had purchased. Now, we all know from the study of Galatians that Abraham believed the gospel, that the gospel was preached to Abraham. When Sarah died, Abraham was in a strange place and he needed a place to bury his wife. And he went to the people there and he said, give me, let me buy a place so that I may bury my dead. And the people said, oh, you're a great man, Abraham. We love you. Let us just give you a place. We'll give you a piece of land for your personal uh, uh, cemetery. And Abraham said, no, I, I, I'd rather buy it. How much do you want for it? And I'll pay you for it. And they said, no, no, no. It would be an insult. We want to give it to you. This is our gift to you. And Abraham said, I appreciate it. But really, I need to buy this property if I'm going to put my loved ones there, if I'm going to bury my dead there. But why is that? He made him sell it to him. And he paid him. And he kept the deed. He owned that property. Now, why was Abraham so insistent that he buy the property? That he was putting Sarah in. Because Abraham believed. In a resurrection of the dead. Amen. He wanted to make sure her body was someplace. Safe. And then when he was buried into that same place. Where Abraham had the deed. And then his son Isaac. And her wife. Buried there where Abraham had the deed. We're all going to be together when he comes. And takes us. And then here comes Leah by herself. She didn't get what she wanted. She didn't get the family. She didn't get the husband. But she's there in the tomb with Abraham awaiting the resurrection.